Real Country 1430 AM and 107.3 FM WRDN. Brian Wenikins uh, from the NAFB Convention. And thank you to our broadcast sponsors, including Wisconsin Soybean Marketing Board, Wisconsin Corn Growers Association, Wisconsin Farmers Union, Synergy Co-op, Osseoplastics, Compere Financial, Animal Wellness Center of Buffalo Valley, Anibis Silo, and El Civia Co-op. Joining us is Emily Score. She is CEO of Growth Energy. And we're going to get a little bit of update on some of the things Growth Energy is uh, doing on the renewable fuel side. And Emily, thanks for joining us this morning. I, I've talked with some of the folks from corn growers and the soybean growers and this RFS, it's it's like EPA's kind of, they want to help, but then they don't want to help. It's, it's it, they're, they're kind of all over the map on this. You know, it is frustrating because on one policy, we'll have a real victory and a, and a very consistent, supportive message and regulation from the agency and then they come out and kind of are different with I would say the tailpipe emission standards for example. So you know the renewable fuel standard here's the state of play for us right now. They've finalized the RFS for the years 24, 25, 26. We have three years of 15 billion gallons of conventional biofuel. That's what we needed. That's what the statute has directed so we're very pleased with that. Uh, right now there's actually a lot of court cases where refiners have sued EPA because they wanted more exemptions that they didn't get. And so we're intervening, we're tracking the, the litigation, we're intervening where we are. So we'll, we'll get some outcomes, I think, in Q1 of next year. Um, and then the conversation is, okay, what about the, the blending obligations for 2026 and beyond? Making sure that the agency recognizes that advanced pool. Renewable diesel is coming online. You've got to have really big advance numbers so you're not cannibalizing the growth opportunity in, con in the conventional biofuel space. M meanwhile, we have uh, the... EPA with their E15 rules and finally you know a few years back Wisconsin's governor along with other governors Republicans and Democrats got together in the Midwest and basically told EPA we're done we're doing it too bad but EPA is still dragging their feet I know and I commend right now we've got seven Midwestern governors who have petitioned EPA and said enough we don't want to deal with the federal government we want to offer this fuel year-round for our consumers EPA has really dragged its feet on essentially saying, yes, that's fine. And so by statute, uh, we're months and months delayed in terms of EPA coming out. They need to do this via, via a final rulemaking. They came out with a proposal earlier this year. Everybody's pushing the agency to get this out so that the fuel supply chain can prepare and consumers will be able to optimize these options next summer. Talking with Emily Score with uh, Growth Energy this morning from the NAFB convention. Meanwhile, there's the, the sustainable um, airline fuel or airplane fuel. So how does this, obviously EPA can't say, well, you know what, we're going to have an electric airplane. That ain't going to work. So we can, we can, there's no EV airplane, so we'll throw that one out. But I suppose we'll still have, what, blowback from EPA and refiners on this too? Or, or is this a different kettle of fish because there's money to be made and money to be saved? It's a little bit different kettle of fish, but we still do have adversaries on this one. And that really comes from the far left, the progressives, who, it's, for them, it's ideology. They, they do not want production agriculture to be part of a green economy. We all know that agriculture is a huge part of the effort to decarbonize, whether it's light-duty vehicles or maritime or, or planes. And you're right. I think everybody recognizes you're not going to electrify aviation, the aviation se sector. Ethanol can be a feedstock for sustainable aviation fuel. And here are the numbers. This is the opportunity for us as an industry. Last year, we produced domestically 16 million gallons of sustainable aviation fuel. Well, the president's commitment is 3 billion gallons by 2030. That's a huge increase in production. Biofuels, we're the only feedstock that's available in an abundant enough supply. So we've got to get some policy things right. Uh, we have to make sure that the tax code uses the right modeling to reflect and give us credit for everything we're doing in our innovation space. And, you know, we're, but we're excited to get there. It's kind of a blue sky, new market opportunity for us. Um, and the good news is the airlines want our product. So you're not fighting against the airlines. You're actually working with the airlines on this one. So, so that's because they're looking at there's money to be saved here. And, and again, I, I, it's, it, it does end up boiling down to be about the Benjamins. I mean, we have to recognize that. You know, I, I mean, I think I think for the airlines, it's really they've got they've got climate goals and they've made commitments to their investors, to their customers. And so that's, I, I think, what what's driving them in many respects. 
Um, the challenge is as sustainable aviation fuel actually isn't affordable. It's more expensive right now because we're in the infancy. So we do need some tax credits. There are tax credits available. And if you stack those up, you can make it competitive with, with traditional jet fuel. Um, but, you know, it's a new market. And so like any new market opportunity, you need some certainty and clarity out of Washington, D.C., so that people are willing to take the risk and make the investments well, because it's a calculated risk. And I think, all right, the ROI is going to be there down the road. Do, has there been any studies on, okay, you know, what could this mean for corn growers, soybean growers, because if, if this really does take off? So we've, you know, we've done some independent analysis, even just kind of internally within growth energy. And I think, you know, different people are going to say, you know, maybe one, two billion gallons of opportunity for ethanol. Right, so you translate that into corn growers. So that's that's a substantial opportunity right there um, on the corn ethanol side. And so it's also important for us, too, because as fuel, as, as cars become more efficient, as you do have more electric vehicles coming online, we've got to make sure that we have another market that we can tap into. So that's the opportunity, I think, for SAF. I think it's going to be great for ethanol. It's going to be great for our grower partners, too. That is Emily Score, CEO of Growth Energy. From the NAFB convention, I'm Brian Winnikins on WRDN.